Hello everybody, it's your Peacekeeper. Welcome back to the Gaming Lounge, and it is time for the next video in our How to Play series on the Russian Cruiser Line. This is actually the last video. This is the Tier 10 Russian Cruiser Moskva. And Moskva is, at least as far as we're historically speaking, based on the Project 66 Heavy Cruiser, which, according to the World Warships Wikipedia page, was an attempt by the Russian designers to create a counter to the American Des Moines-class heavy cruisers. It was designed to be faster, carry more powerful armament, as well as to have a, an, a fairly large immunity zone towards the Des Moines 8-inch shells. In 1953, her plans were actually tweaked to improve her survivability after they realized that there might be a perceived edge to the Des Moines-class cruiser in medium and close-range engagements. This pushed the tonnage of the proposed Project 66 heavy cruiser to 30,000 tons, which is equivalent to that of the Alaska large cruisers, Alaska class large cruisers, while only carrying a heavy cruiser's firepower. First planned ship was to be laid down in 1953 and finished by 1957, but Stalin's death canceled the construction of all large naval ships. With the end of our historical discussion, it's time to talk about the ship's in-game playstyle. Moskva is very much the same overall playstyle as Dmitry Donskoy. However, her armor, hit point pool, and faster loading, higher caliber guns do change that dynamic quite a bit and can make Moskva a situationally fun tier 10 cruiser to play. And what I mean by that is, is Moskva's ideal environment is very similar to, I'm, I'm going to say the Des Moines, in that when you have lots of islands that you can just poke your nose around, Moskva actually does really, really well. In open maps, Moskva can be kind of frustrating to play if you are trying to get a lot of Citadel hits. If you want to sit at max range and burn everything, you can actually do that. Moskva does have a viable build in the ranged fire starting department. However, my experience is that much like all the rest of the Russian cruisers, the fire starting chance on the 180 millimeter and 220 millimeter guns, like on Dmitry Donskoy, Kirov, and Moskva, just don't have the same fire starting chance in the low DPM of the six inch guns that we saw on board Chapayev. And so as a result, Moskva uh, in my opinion, at least the more fun way to play Moskva is going to be at the medium ranges, right basically at the edge of her radar range, which is a little bit shorter than her detection range. And the large caliber guns can actually make for very interesting gameplay. They are one of the fastest shelves in the game. The AP does a significant amount of damage and they reload reasonably quick. And that can make for a very, very fun play style if you are going to get cruisers that are willing to show broadsides at relatively close ranges. The problem is, is that her size, extremely poor concealment, and massive citadel can also make her die rather quickly, unless she sits really in that awkward position between a battle cruiser and just a standard heavy cruiser. The 50 millimeter bow plating here, actually can bounce Yamato shells when nose on. However, 25 millimeters above and below it means that any shells launched from any range are going to come down and plunge into this rather ridiculously massive citadel. And as you can see, the citadel's armor is only six inches in the sides and about seven from the front. Six and a half, seven in that range on the front. And... Yeah, not going to stop you a 16 inch shell that comes down from the sky, which means that if you're playing U.S. Battleship, you want your shells to impact the upper portion as they come down because they're going to come down right into that citadel and the poor Moskva isn't going to handle it. Of course, if Moskva exposes any form of a broadside, six inches of belt armor isn't going to stop anything. And so, oh man, it requires a... a, a a definite nose-on attitude when it comes to facing other ships. Players that are used to playing Iowa and Missouri and the North Carolina will be right at home in Moskva. 
The any aircraft on board the ship is mediocre, but with the right special upgrade modules, some captain skills, and some upgrades, uh, she could be a decent AA cruiser if she needs to be. However, she does have the longest range radar in the game, and, well, that actually kind of comes with the downside. You have neither the rate of fire nor the HE alpha to actually punish those pesky underage boats when they decide to pop smoke in front of you. So plan accordingly, bring friends. Uh, the radar is also relatively short in terms of its duration, so if you don't have the radar upgrade module, that would uh, be a good upgrade module to get if you're planning on running this as a destroyer picket. Overall, Moskva is a pretty solid Tier 10 cruiser. It's not my p favorite style of play. However, I do recognize that it is also very capable in the right hands. All right, let's talk about some stats. In terms of hit points, we have 65,400 hit points, which is comparable to some Tier 8 battleships. Armor plating. It says up to 300 millimeters, but uh, that's only on the turret faces, which are extremely flat. And by flat, I mean vertical, relatively speaking. And as a result, uh, it's very easy to lose your main battery on this. So uh, probably best not to operate at the super close ranges. Uh, torpedo protection of 28%. The main battery consists of three triple 220 millimeter guns. They have a 9.1 second reload time, 32.8 second 180 degree turn time, 155 meter dispersion at 19.4 kilometers. That's pretty dang tight. Your HE fire starting chance is 19%. However, you're looking at 9 seconds between reload. It's just not nearly as effective at starting fires as I would like it to be. For having a 19% fire chance, it really doesn't feel like it. Uh, you do not need IFHE to make Moskva work. 36 millimeters. At least I don't think I have IFHE on this, Captain. Shouldn't. Nope. Can't even get it, according to this. Okay, well, that's news. So, 19% uh, fire chance, 36 millimeter in terms of HE shell pen. The AP shell does 5,800 damage, and these things are coming out at 9.1 seconds. Ugh, that's, that's potent. 985 meter per second shell velocity for both AP and HE. The secondary battery consists of four dual 130 millimeter guns. These actually have a surprising 8.2 kilometer range. And they're actually laid out in not a completely awful... I'm just kidding. It, it's pretty much awful. Outside of exposing a rather large portion of the uh, you know side of your ship, the rear ones or the front ones, depending on what direction you're going, aren't going to be contributing a whole lot. But they do have a surprising amount of range, all things considered. In terms of anti-aircraft defense, we have six quad 25mm guns. They're going to occupy that uh, 0 to 2.3km range. We have six quad 45 millimeters, which occupy the 2.3 to 3.5 kilometer range. And then those 130 millimeter, the four dual uh, 130 millimeter guns are going to occupy our long range anti-aircraft, which goes out to 6.6 .6 kilometers down to three and a half kilometers. The max speed of this Ship is 34 and a half knots, and with that speed comes the downside. A 1,050 meter turning circle radius. Holy buckets, it's a battleship. 8.7 second rudder shift time, though. That is not a dual rudder shift upgrade spec. So, reasonably quick rudder shift for a ship this size. Again, it feels awfully lazy at the helm, but if you're playing this ship mostly bow on anyway, it's not going to matter a whole lot. Detection range of 14.1 kilometers by sea, 7.6 by air. All right, let's talk about those upgrades now. There are a number of different builds in which we could actually go on this, but in the first slot, I'm recommending Main Armaments Mod 1. And, and the reason why I'm recommending this is because I've really found that the main battery on this ship gets taken out. And by taken out, I, I don't mean, like, completely destroyed, although I have had that happen. I mean, it gets uh, shell-shocked, or whatever you want to call it, where it gets take temporarily taken out. And as a result of that... Uh, Main armaments mod one, you know, 20% reduction in the risk of the main battery becoming incapacitated, 50% increase in the hit point pool of it, and a 20% reduction in the time it takes to repair it. 
Now, if you want to run the ship as an anti-aircraft picket, you could also take Auxiliary Armaments Mod 1. This is basically going to double the hit point pool of your anti-aircraft batteries. Magazine Mod 1 is there for those who don't have detonation flags or are afraid that their battle cruiser is going to get detonated. It's extremely rare, but there it is. 70% reduction. In the second slot, you can see I'm actually running the special upgrade for Defensive AA Fire Mod 1, and this is going to increase the action time of Defensive Fire by 20%. However, I would say this is one of the few cruisers in which all three of these are viable options. Damage Control Systems Mod 1, minus 5% chance of catching on fire, minus 3% chance of catching, uh, uh, being flooded, I guess when you get hit by a torpedo. Propulsion Mod 1, 20% reduction on the risk of your engine being incapacitated, as well as a 20% reduction in the time it takes to repair it. And Steering Gears Mod 1 is the same as Propulsion Mod 1, except for, for your steering gears. The reason why I finally say Damage Control Systems Mod 1 is actually useful, it's because you have a hit point pool in which this can actually be utilized. The minus 5% chance of catching on fire is important when you're dealing with pesky cruisers at longer ranges uh, that are HE spammers. <coughs> Ow! <coughs> Sorry about that. Had a bad cough. Uh, but uh, if, when you're dealing with ships like that, this ship does get started on fire relatively easy. So especially since you're mostly stationary or not moving super fast. So this does actually have a viable build. But I've chosen defensive AA fire because, uh, well, carriers are a thing again. In the third slot, I'm running aiming systems mod one for the 7% reduction in the dispersion of your main battery. And that's about the only reason I run that mod. It does also increase the secondary battery firing range by 5% and decreases the dispersion of it by 5%. However, secondary battery build on this ship is useless, so please don't run that. You could also run AA Guns Mod 1 for the increase in the number of explosions from long and medium range AA by 2. Yeah, we'll just leave that at that. Uh, I don't personally recommend main battery mod 2. Chances are you're never going to need it. The turrets turn relatively fast. It's never been an issue for me to need the faster turret traverse, but the 5% hit to the reload time is kind of a big deal. In the fourth slot, I am running steering gears mod 2 for the 20% reduction in the rudder shift time. Some people are going to ask, propulsion systems mod 2? You could... If you plan on spending a lot of time stationary, Propulsion Mod 2 could be of use. Just keep in mind that you're increasing your rudder shift time uh, to just over 10 seconds. That's a fairly long rudder shift time, and in my opinion, not very comfortable. I personally prefer Steering Gears Mod 2 so that I can sometimes evade fire at longer ranges. You could also run Damage Control Systems Mod 2 once again, going back to... The second upgrade slot, this is going to take your fire extinguishing time and reduce it by 15%, as well as the time it takes to recover from flooding by 15%. And this would fit in with the survivability build, if you will. For me, Steering Gears Mod 2, that's my cho choice for survivability. Avoiding fire is better than taking fire. In the fourth, fifth slot, math, I have chosen Concealment Systems Mod 1 for the 10% reduction in the ship's detection range. Also the 10% reduction in the detection by aircraft, as well as a 5% increase in the dispersion of shells fired at you. You could also take Steering Gears Mod 3, but once again we're talking about adding 10% to your uh, concealment. And I just don't know that it's worth that. The ship already can be seen from space. It has very little counters to anything heavier than, uh, you know, say a 16-inch shell. Or heavier. So personally, I would not uh, recommend running that mod here. That's just my opinion. Uh, target acquisition is mod 1 on this cruiser. Not worth it. In the last slot, you can see I'm running main battery mod 3 for the 12% reduction in the time it takes to reload the main battery. This does come with a penalty. It does slow down your turrets by 13%. However, I found that the main battery reload definitely outweighs the, punning, the punishment in terms of the turret traverse. So for me... I highly recommend running the main battery reload. Now, you could also run AA Guns Mod 2, which is going to increase the DPS of your AA Guns by 
You could also run Gunfire Control Systems Mod 2 for an extra 16% in range, but I definitely wouldn't recommend running Secondary Battery Mod 2. That's all we've got for the import stuff. Let's go look at this in a battle video. All right, so as you can see here, I'm div divved up with Hawk USMC and TL Warlord. And uh, this match is going to be one of those rare high tier matches on uh, Shards. I almost said Haven. That's also a pretty rare map to get at the high tier, but Shards is even more rare. And of course, this is a different version of Shards that I remember. This, this was a bit of a shock to me. I, I wish I had the TeamSpeak recording for this because... Uh, I was pretty shocked this is the first time I had played Shards uh, in a long time, let alone at Tier 10. So this will be an interesting fight, but we're going to go, we're going to find this island that's basically straight ahead of us, and we're going to look at the sea cap, and we're going we're gonna to go that direction for now. I will tell you, this is not a victory for us. This ends up in a loss, but this does showcase the strengths of Moskva, especially at the medium to close ranges. Um, not that I really would recommend playing the ship in super close ranges, uh, but eh, it does have some strengths when it gets there. It doesn't have the advantages that most Russian cruisers have of surprise torpedoes, but it is what it is. Everybody was hoping for a CV battle. Well, no, nobody was hoping for a CV battle. Man, no thank you. So, uh... A couple of things to pay attention to in this video is uh, pay attention to when I'm using AP and when I'm using HG. Pay attention to how I've got myself angled, what I'm putting between myself and an enemy incoming fire. And really, Moskva is about mitigating damage intake as much as you can to stay in the fight as long as you can. Uh, she can be durable. It just depends on what's shooting at you, what angle you're presenting, and whether or not you can bait them into shooting that 50 millimeters of armor at the belt line. And we are going to see a little bit of the power of Moskva's 50 millimeter front bow plating in this video. The other thing to, to pay attention to here is the use of different consumables. Now, obviously, we have... Defensive AA fire, and that's pretty much a useless skill in this match because there is no AA, so we won't see that too much, but we'll see some radar usage. We will also see some of our heal used up here. So on this map, my experience has always been that there's going to be teams that decide to come this way, and I was not wrong. Okay, so we've got ourselves a Montana, but Island... We got a shell over. A singular AP shell made it over. Okay, we got a Battleship Hindenburg. That's gonna get some shells over. Can we get a Citadel? Nope, we are a little behind. Okay. Uh, normal penetrating hit that did zero damage. Thank you, Wargaming. And now it's a matter of just seeing the targets. Of course, T Warlord is uh, in his Yugamo over here doing his best to try and uh, spot, but the rest of our team basically abandoned us on this, on this flank, which I guess isn't horribly surprising. Okay, there's Montana. Tirpitz, you can't sneak any over that. I don't know that we're going to get anything there either. We got one shell over once again. And an overpen. Our first damage. I was hoping that Des Moines would come out of there. Alright, well this isn't working, let's speed up. We need to go help Hawk, he's in a really bad location, he's taken all the enemy fire. Do need to pay attention to what's going on, oh my goodness. This is this is one of those th times when having a carrier would be nice for the, the extra spotting, but really what I was hoping that I would be able to do here is work my way around these uh, islands here to actually start flanking this enemy force. But what I found is, is that, nope. We're going to go ahead and we're going to pop our radar. There's a enemy gearing. So we'll go ahead and we'll engage the gearing. We're obviously detected by something else. And as you can see, 2,000 damage with two shell hits. I mean, that's... It's not horrible, but it's not great either. I Just not... Uh, oop, another shell hit there. And with that ends our joy 
in air quotes, if you can call it that, of, of shooting at the gearing. That's what I was talking about with the radar consumable being pretty short-lived, and with that comes some added frustration. So we've switched back to armor piercing. We have uh, Montana here that we're going to go ahead and we're going to engage. Again, working our hardest to keep... Oh, we got a Citadel on a Montana. Yeah, that just happened. Yeah, that's the kind of AP pen that we've got. And as you can see here, 6,000 damage. We took out an AA gun mount in there. Okay, so we're going to start backing up a little bit here. 2,300 damage. That's not very good. We're just going to have to focus the uh, ship down. Oh, okay, she beached herself. Normally I'd be concerned about this Yugamo, but I really want this Montana dead because it's a tier 10 battleship. We need to get its firepower out of this match if we can. And so I've told Hawk to just go ahead and continue to focus on the Montana because he has the more powerful guns. We can obviously negate the damage from the Tirpitz because the Tirpitz 15 inch guns will not go through. There's another Citadel on the Montana. The Tirpitz's guns will actually not go through the bow armor of either a U.S. battleship, or sorry, U.S. heavy cruiser like uh, Baltimore or Buffalo or Des Moines. And so as a result, we, uh, we don't need to worry as much about her as we do the 16-inch guns of the Montana. So there's our last salvo out. Those torpedoes are going to find him. Now it's on to the Tirpitz. And as you can see here, we're backing up. We're doing a pretty good job of mitigating damage. Hawk is taking it all, unfortunately for him. And the downside to this is our back is to their enemy team. I have no idea where that gearing is at. Uh, Wargaming Dispersion is not cooperating, so bow on target. Not doing so hot. And now his secondary is coming to play. Of course, he starts moving forward, and that's when my shots start just missing altogether. So now we're dealing with his... Uh, you know, secondary battery mostly. And as you can see there, we just go ahead and ignore basically all of his damage. So the key to this engagement so far has been to not overextend, mitigate what avenues enemy ships have of damaging you, and then finding creative ways to uh, reposition yourself without too much issue. That Yugamo is really annoying though. Hindenburg. We have a Des Moines over here as well that I would like to kill. Be nice. Mr. Habarovsk. Uh-oh. Uh -uh. <laughs> Uh-oh. Even worse. Torpedoes incoming. Uh, Tirpitz just got nuked by Warlord. We've got that broadside Hindenburg, so I'm going to go ahead and shoot at him. Three overpens. I'm exposing enough of a broadside that this is actually a bit of a problem. If he shoots AP it'll, at me, it'll be a bad day. Ooh, there's 13,000 and a kill. And that's what I was talking about. You get a broadside cruiser and this ship will just punish it. Broadside battle, I mean, heck, we got two citadels on a Montana for crying out loud. It's not like Montana is poorly armored by any stretch of the imagination. So at this point, uh, there's a Des Moines over here. There's also this Yugamo. Uh, anything we can do to engage either one of these and actually kill them would be amazing. So we've turned on our radar to keep the Yugamo spotted while also trying to spot the Des Moines. Trying to get some good hits lined up for the Des Memes. But as you can see... Oops. Took out... Ooh. <laughs> An overpen somehow. As you can see there, we're, we're angling our best to try and keep the Des Moines in check. So once he's, uh, you know, back behind the island here, well, I guess we can, uh, I don't know, we'll just, we'll just kind of play this by ear. Moskva has enough armor that I think we could quite easily uh, tank Des Moines for a little bit anyway, while bow on. Ooh, look, coming around the corner here. At these close ranges, uh, Moskva can be a bit of a headache to try and get some good Citadel hits with, but... Well, we'll just keep uh, pounding away. As you can see, he bounces all of our shells. So at this point, now I'm going to focus on his guns. We're actually going to end up playing this game in his advantage. It's not a good thing 
So the key to this is to make sure that we are playing patiently, exposing enough of a, an angle. I'm going to try and take out his guns if I can, because that will happen. And now we're going to turn our guns and be patient. Yep, there we go. So in these drive-by shootings like this, the key is to not do this turn fight. So neither one of us turned, my secondaries are actually contributing, so that's kind of funny. But the key to these is not to get into that turn fight. Now he's exposing his, his back to me. I can put rounds through the back end of his ship here and actually get some good damage. So you see there was 7,000 damage. We're going to have our secondaries target him. We will turn this guy into a kill. Down he goes. Coming over here, Yugumo is now dead. Don't know if Yugumo has launched torpedoes or not. We're going to go ahead and repair. We lost a fairly large amount of uh, hit points to that Des Moines in one salvo. And that's that fine edge between having enough armor and not enough armor. But as you can see, all of our team went to the south. All of our team died in the south. How? Makes no sense to me. There are some pretty uh, frustrating things that happen throughout this one. We have a Conqueror that's over there doing, I don't know what he is doing. Uh, and towards the end of this match, it gets to be a real headache scratcher. But we're up to 87,000 damage now. Oh, come on. Give me another Citadel. Nope. 5,000 damage. I'll take that, though. Two kills, four Citadels, 102 hits, three fires, of which I think two of them were actually started by our secondaries. Which is pretty funny, considering I put a pretty good test case out there for the reasons why the secondary build on this is not a good idea. But our secondaries have contributed to at least something. Uh-oh. Well, that's no good. So there's that gearing again. We're going to go ahead and we're going to have one salvo of AP and then we're going to switch. He's going to be just out. Ooh, you're in my radar range. Okay, so go ahead and sit stationary there. We're going to use this island here once again, using the island cover to minimize the amount of uh, ships that can shoot at us, minimize the amount of damage that they can certainly do to us, while maximizing our at least target potential. So there's another fire, 2,000 damage. As you can see, we're not doing like huge amounts of damage with HE, and this is one of the more frustrating aspects of this, and our radar is about to go down. But the gearing beaches himself once again. So now we have the opportunity. You can see I'm starting to turn so that I can get the back turret into play. We need to be careful because I don't know what the buffalo is currently doing. Okay, and there goes the gearing. That's why I started to go forward and back. And that's what I was worried about. So we have a, we have a problem. The buffalo is coming around the edge of this island. I don't have any way to see him. Our Conqueror is over at the sea cap doing... Well, he's capping the point, which... That'd be admirable if we were actually, you know, going to win this fight via capping. Should have probably capped that before. Ooh. <laughs> this is a bad position. This is really bad positioning. That's going to hurt. Ooh. Managed to avoid significant damage. Okay, so get one more quick salvo off. Had AP loaded. Try and angle as best we can. Whew. We got real lucky there by not getting another Citadel, and that Buffalo is actually on fire. Ooh, Kronstadt. Kronstadt is another cruiser that has a fairly large Citadel, if you can actually find it. it always comes down to finding it, however. And we're just out of range of the Friedrich der Gross, but oi. All right, well, here comes Battleship Yamato. Yamato, believe it or not, you can actually Citadel with this ship. Um, Jean Bart, Jean Bart, not really super worried about her. Still more worried about the Buffalo than anything. And there was some upper deck pens there, so we're out of heels. We're going to shoot HE at this Yamato and see if we can't actually get some fires. But at 2,000 damage a salvo, you can see this isn't going to add up real well. Trying to get those HE shells to impact near the superstructure. And... Ooh, come on! 
Jeez. 8,000 damage while we're doing 781. HE shell damage, not the best. And we're going to get about one more good salvo before we end up underwater. That said, we did manage to get three kills here. We did manage to do a fairly decent chunk. Ooh, Kronstadt, overmatching the front armor. Nice. And 136,951 damage. Ooh, we're in the 137s. How high will it go? That looks like it's it. So we got three kills, 137,726 damage. You saw the advantages that the ship can have with regards to its relative durability. Had I been in a Des Moines, Yamato would have definitely made short work of the, um, short work of, of Des Moines. I, I just, the Citadel on Des Moines is too large. There's not enough, uh, obviously, not enough belt armor in the front to actually make it work. I don't know what this Conqueror is doing. Why are you sailing broadside to their whole team? Maybe maybe it's because he rightfully believes that this match is basically over. But uh, seriously, don't make it super easy for them to get huge damage numbers. Go on, man. But um, there's, there's definitely a, a good solid case to be made that, uh, you know, Moskva in the right hands at the right situations can really have some distinct advantages. And we actually got to see... The, those advantages. We took a flank that had three battleships, a heavy cruise, two heavy cruisers, and a destroyer, all the way up here at the sea cap, and we were able to push through it. While the bulk of our team, and that was just three of us, basically, that four of us that were able to do that. While the bulk of our team went to the other cap and ended up all dying. So there goes our conqueror, and that's the end of the match. So in the right hands, at the right play, you can actually accomplish quite a lot in Moskva. As we wait for the UI to load. 137,727 damage, 3 kills, 4 citadels. Top of the team, 1,304 base XP. What was our secondary damage? That's what I want to see. Secondary hits, only 891 damage, but we got a couple fires out of it, so it was totally worth it. Anyway, Moskva can be fun. It is a pretty middle-of-the-road cruiser with a different playstyle that I'm not really a big fan of. However, it does work reasonably well. Anyway, I'm your peacekeeper. Like, comment, subscribe if you haven't already. And thanks for watching.